continue to talk about what happened in the West Virginia game. We're also going to uh, you know, break down the controversial call that happened in the game where the personal foul pla- flag was picked up. Uh, we're going to get Josh in here in a second. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties on that end, but he'll be right with us as we uh, break things down as well. Uh, but that's going to be on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Make sure you drop your questions, your comments in, in the YouTube chat. If you're not subscribed to the show over on YouTube, make sure you've done that as well. But we will. And here's Josh. We're going to have more on Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Sooners, a special live edition of Locked On Sooners over on the YouTube side. So if you're not subscribed to the show and want to be a part of the live show, make sure you go to YouTube and hit the subscribe button over there. I'm John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here making it at Josh on Ref. Josh Helmer. You can also hear him Monday through Friday on 94.7, the Ref in Norman. Josh, what's up, man? uh, You know, still still trying trying to make sense of Oklahoma football game they're now again in a 500 football team on this season really following the, the setback in Morgan uh, with Oklahoma State and then uh, pretty good trip to Lubbock, Texas I mean a road trip for this team right now was bowl eligibility that right now this team so for the Sooners they so we're losing we're losing Josh's connection here a little bit I'm going to pop him out and we'll come back with that but what Josh is getting at is it's shocking that this team is five and five I mean the preseason expectations are one thing but to not even live up to them just a little bit is kind of surprising I mean, this is a team that whether they were going to be a Big 12 contender or not, the fact that they've only won five games, that you go on the road to Morgantown and you lose a game to West Virginia that was last place in the Big 12, just really, uh, it's unthinkable, really. Like, this is a team that hadn't lost to West Virginia all in, in West Virginia's Big 12 existence. And they kind of laid an egg. I mean, offensively, it just wasn't good enough. You can talk about the weather, you can talk about, you know, Dylan Gabriel being off, regardless. You had a, a guy run for 200 yards in this game, and you couldn't win. It is just not good. And that starts at the offensive coordinator with Jeff Levy, down to your quarterback, to your wide receivers. I think other than Drake Stoops and maybe even Jalil Farouk a little bit, I mean, those two guys were arguably your best players on the on the day. While Marvin Mims is one of your better wide receivers, he wasn't consistent in this game, and he wasn't clicking with the quarterback and that matters like chemistry matters i've talked about it on this show quite a bit whether it's offensive line chemistry or quarterback wide receiver chemistry that stuff matters it's the little things like catching a deep ball knowing where your quarterback's going to throw the deep ball the quarterback knowing how to time that and space it and put it out there for you that's just been a season a, a, an issue all season long with this team and it's part of the reason that they're five and five it's just not been good enough offensively. We had higher expectations for Dylan Gabriel coming into this season, and he hasn't lived up to him. That's just kind of where we sit, you know. And Josh, you're kind of alluding to the idea that this team at five and five hasn't been able to secure bowl eligibility, and in the the, the reality, the reality that they haven't lived up to expectations preseason wise, even a little bit. I mean, I think. By about the third game in Big 12 play, we figured, okay, this isn't a Big 12 title contender. But the fact that they haven't been able to consistently build upon that is just is a problem. It's a problem for this team. And while I think most people still believe that this is going to turn around and, and Brent Venables is going to be able to build a program that is going to be competitive, this season, it's it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch this team um, lose in, in some of the ways that they've lost, especially the way they lost on Saturday. Sure it is. Yeah, the bowl eligibility is just that that's how this thing rivals throughout the offseason that this would be a losing year. 
you know, massive home. I think almost in general, just to needle Oklahoma departure of Lincoln Riley, and yet genuinely saw this thing. I mean, sure, three line four, right? I think was on the once we got to the finish line, didn't totally click. If quarterback that you thought he was going to be, or or this defense. Right to where they wanted to go. Four, four losses a possibility. The I season though, you'd be legitimately fighting for bowl. Well, is shocking. Yeah. Hey, Josh. I'm still not with, sure what's up with the audio on on your end. Um, but it's it's kind of hit and miss. It's just real uh, real spotty there. Um, so, folks, it's. This team is where they are. You are what your record says you are. That's an old Bill Parcells, you know, phraseology there. So how can it get better? I mean, they've still got two games left. And while we've talked about these last three games being winnable games for this team, does anybody really have confidence that they're going to be able to go into this game or into this weekend and get a win over, over Oklahoma state? That's, that's something I'm not sure about. I mean, this is a team that, has struggled, you know, for most of this season against running quarterbacks. If Spencer Sanders is healthy, are they going to be able to stop him? I don't know. Uh, that's that's a question I have going into this weekend. Even though Oklahoma is, I think, a seven and a half point favorite uh, with most betting sites right now, it's hard for me to to have much confidence in this team going into this game. Even though it's at home, even though. I mean, I, I don't even know really what to say about what Oklahoma is better at necessarily. Maybe they run the ball better than Oklahoma State does, but that's really all I can really hang my hat on going into this game. Is my sound improved? No, I, I, I don't have – so I don't know. I, I think we might just need to try and back out and see what we can do here. Hey, we might have to restart the stream here um, here in a second. Sorry about the, the technical difficulties that we're having on our end, folks. Um, we appreciate you all hanging in. Um, Jimmy says there's zero confidence here and I don't blame you, Jimmy. I really, it's, it's hard to find a whole lot of confidence based on what we saw. I mean, the weather is supposed to be below freezing going into Bedlam primetime game after dark. And so if that's the case and the weather was an issue for Dylan Gabriel this past Saturday at West Virginia, it doesn't give me a lot of hope and a lot of promise that this is going to get better for Oklahoma's passing attack this Saturday night against an Oklahoma state defense that hadn't really played very well until this past weekend against Iowa state when they forced five turnovers. But again, that's Iowa state, Hunter Deckers. I mean, when Hunter Deckers throws you three interceptions, I mean, you're going to win that game and your defense is going to look really, really good along the way. Um, I have a hard time looking at this team based on what we saw on Saturday and feeling good about their, their prospects of winning either of these last two games because Texas Tech has looked good in recent weeks. Oklahoma State, a lot of it's going to depend on Spencer Sanders' availability and his health. If he's back you know, closer to 100%, then maybe you know, that gives Oklahoma State the edge a little bit. But even if he's 80%, uh, you know, if, if he's got his legs available to him, then, you know, Spencer Sanders is going to, is going to hurt Oklahoma because they have struggled slowing down the run. We talked about it on last night's show, Adrian Martinez, Max Duggan, and now Garrett Green looking like Tim Tebow, Robert Griffin, the third Johnny Manziel on you. And that's kind of where Oklahoma's defense is at. Even, even though they played the rest of the traditional running game for West Virginia pretty well, they held them to like 2.1 yards per carry. Everybody other than Garrett Green was held to 2.1 yards per carry. So the run defense looked better, but they still can't stop the quarterback run. And if they're not going to be able to stop the quarterback run, it's going to be really difficult for Oklahoma to, in my opinion, to slow down Spencer Sanders and the Oklahoma State Cowboys. We're going to continue to talk about West Virginia. We're going to, we got to get into that personal foul penalty that was picked up uh, on the late hit on CJ Colden. We'll talk about that here in a second, but first let me talk to you about simply safe. Hey, speaking of safe, big 12, got to keep people safe. And if you're trying to keep you and your family safe, you might want to go check out simply safe. If you've thought about securing your home with home security, but have been putting it off, 
you'll want to list it up right now. Locked on Sooners listeners can order the number one rated Simply Safe home security system for 50% off. This is their biggest offer of the year, and you won't want to miss it. If you've ever had a package stolen off your front porch, I know we have. It, it sucks. You hate losing something that you were expecting in the mail, whether it's a gift for somebody else or it's something that you're trying to have in your home to either spruce up the decor or something that you really needed. Somebody takes that off your front porch. It really hurts. And so putting some security in your home, outside cameras, that might help provide a little bit more safer environment for you. You can get that through Simply Safe. In an emergency, 24-7 professional monitoring agents use fast protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real. So you can get priority police response. Simply Safe is a whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. HD security cameras for inside and out, smarter ways to detect motion that alert you only when a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. 24-7 professional monitoring service that costs less than a dollar a day, less than half the price of ADT's traditional professionally installed system. So don't miss your chance to save big on the only security system that we recommend. Get 50% off any new Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com slash locked on college. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash locked on college. There's no safe like Simply Safe. And thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We appreciate all of the subscribers, all of your downloads. We had our biggest episode this past Friday that was actually the biggest episode on the Locked On College Network by quite a bit. So big thank you to all of you who listened to that show with, with Josh and our guy Josh Neighbors from the Locked On Big 12 show as well. And then I came in kind of at the end, closed the deal like a Mario Mariano Rivera there with our Big 12 picks uh, or with our, our keys to the game and our OU Texas or OU West Virginia pick. Sorry we were wrong on that one, uh, Sooners fans. But Josh, let's see if we have you here. Do you have me? Yes, yes we've got you. Got you. Yes, it's good. We're good. We're good. So, hey, let's let's just start with the personal foul penalty um, that was – I know we don't like to blame refs. I know it's like the cool thing to do to just say, hey, you should have played better. You're, as a team, if you'd have made a few more plays here, you'd have executed here, then you shouldn't have to rely on the refs. And while all that is true, it's 100% true, Oklahoma had to play better for the other, you know, however many plays that they played in that game the referee still had an impact on this one. It's still, I mean, it was a very impactful penalty. Okay. So an offsides on Oklahoma, Garrett green gets a free play, throws it down the field. CJ Colden tracks it into the end zone because Garrett green's not a good quarterback. He overthrows, you know, his wide receiver by like 15 yards. CJ Colden tracks it, picks it off. He's giving himself up, going to kneel down in the end zone, take the touch back because he's, way deep in the end zone as he should smart play by him giving himself up the West Virginia player cold clocks him like shoulder to the helmet personal foul the flag comes out immediately and then they meet up and they pick up the flag I don't know how you do that in that at all what regardless of the moment of the game I don't know how you pick up that flag has the big 12 issued any kind of an apology yet today not that I've seen on it I've not seen anything from the big 12 on it that is so disappointing for where we're at with the game of football for that to slide by. You know, look, to all the conspiracy theorists out there, here's your moment, right? Here, here's your moment to say, hmm, Big 12 had an opportunity to do what was right and kind of had the chance to instead sit there and burn Oklahoma a little bit. I, I just think to me, look, maybe it was just as – honest as a slight oversight by a good officiating crew. I don't know that there was necessarily anything nefarious involved, but it feels that way, right? To some Oklahoma fans out there bigger than that though, man, it's don't sit there and tell me that you're about player safety. And then a player is intercepted. The football clearly is giving themselves up and somebody comes flying in and honestly probably could have been evaluated for a targeting ejection in that circumstance and they don't do either don't tell me you're about player safety you're not about player safety you don't care about player safety and uh the fact that we haven't seen a legitimate apology yet shows again that you're not about player safety it took a play that would have been fourth and 30 and made it fourth and 10 so an an egregious 
position that, you know, that the refs even picked up that flag. It was just absolutely egregious. Let's run through some of these comments. I, I want to address this one first. John Phillips, he says, oh, you will win. This sounds like OSU radio. Bye. Hey, man, listen, I get what you're saying. I'm one of the more optimistic people probably in this fan base, generally speaking, and in media in general. I believe my teams are going to win. I don't know what you've seen from this team to assume that they're going to win. That's my question is what have you seen from this team consistently this season that helps you believe that they're going to win this football game? And if you can't answer that with a straight face or with, without just this, like with objective reasoning, then I don't know why you think we're being haters or we're looking like Oklahoma state radio or whatever. Like, to me, that's the, that's the thing is objectively, I don't know how you can look at this team and think they're going to win. Uh, Chad Littlefield, let's talk about this one, Josh. What happened to the Wildcat? Several fourth, you know, third and fourth and short situations for this team. And we haven't seen the Wildcat for several weeks now. It was a very effective formation for Oklahoma when Braden Willis was running it, and yet they haven't gone back to it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously got off to a good start with it portions of that first quarter versus Texas and then haven't seen a ton of it uh, since the we talked about this in uh, yesterday's show the fact that leading up to the 46 yard field goal try with about six and a half minutes left that obviously Oklahoma missed John that uh, Oklahoma ran every single play on that drive a play drive they ran every single time and uh, they ran on third down and three with Eric Gray which would lead you to believe right that maybe you're thinking this is four down territory and you're going to go for it on fourth down. They obviously didn't do that. So maybe if they get another yard or two yards, John, then they do think about running the wildcat in that uh, situation. But you know, uh, even what the week before with uh, Marcus major, we saw that they, they went the opposite route too, right? They didn't run the wildcat. Yeah. It's been odd to see them not go back to something that was effective at times. And they've even brought, they even brought it back. I believe it was against maybe Iowa State or Kansas, one of those two games where, you know, Braden Willis took the direct snap and, and picked up a first down on it. It's an effective short yardage situation for them or, or short yardage formation. Uh, Greg Ched, he agrees with me from earlier. He says that the receivers and the chemistry between the receivers and Mar uh, Dylan Gabriel is gone. And I agree. It, you know, I think Jaleel Farouk's come on strong. He's been really efficient. Um, out of, in the passing game, Drake Stoops, I think, has done a pretty good job. Of course, a lot of what we've seen from him lately has been on wide receiver screens. But, yeah, between him and Marvin Mims, it's not been great. Like, it, it's it's very hit and miss. It's like a big play here, big drop there, big overthrow there. It's There's nothing continuous, consistent with this team right now. Well, and unfortunately for OU, the young guys haven't stepped up in that regard. I – could not have been more dead wrong. I'll be the first to fess up to that and say that if you go back and roll the tape from, and there's not a lot of, you know, folks out in the media, by the way, that are willing to say, Hey, I got this or that wrong. By the way, you can listen to plenty of folks in the Oklahoma city market that would like to tell you all the times they get it right. But back in the summer, back in the summer, I would have thought and did think that either Jaden Gibson or Nick Anderson was going to be a very serious factor for Oklahoma, just given guys that left in the transfer portal, the fact that the wide receiver position, John, a lot of times plays out that way to where young guys could step right in and make contributions. And it, uh, it obviously just, it hasn't been that And Marvin Mims. I don't know what's going on with him. You know, he finishes, obviously he had the, what big, uh, big 67 yarder, but outside of that, he had the, the drop. And so, man, I, I don't know what's going on with him. He's had a couple of times this season where he's had opportunities for big plays, John, and that's been a sure thing with him. In the past, in this year, it's like anything that can go wrong has gone wrong, and that includes Marvin Mims. Yeah, I also wonder. So you you'll admit that you were wrong on the freshman. I, I was wrong on the transfer guys. I thought JV and Hester and LV Bunkley Shelton were going to have big impacts on this team, and they've had very little, if no, impact on this season. And it's kind of surprising. Like you brought these two guys in, you'd think that the, you'd play them, even though they didn't come in until you know. April, May, June, you'd think that they'd still be able to figure out a way to get on the field based on previous production and experience. You'd like to have that experience on the field at times, but yeah, they haven't been able to crack the lineup consistently. And that's, that's been a bit of, of a surprise for me with this team. Um, 
you know, one of the, one of the things I kind of faulted Lincoln Riley for last year was rotating his receivers too much, you know, getting, you know, way too many guys involved and not being, not focusing the offense on Marvin Mims as much. Um, but maybe this year they're not getting as many wide receivers involved. We've seen Gavin Freeman a little bit, but aside from Jaleel Farouk, Theo Weiss, Drake Stoops, and Marvin Mims, you haven't really seen many, much of anything else uh, consistently from this team. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly what is going on with the the chemistry, but it's definitely not right. And you think with the time that they got to spend together over the offseason – that they'd have a better feel for how to hit that deep ball more consistently because you know it's a big part of their playbook. Uh, we're going to continue to talk through some of your comments, your questions uh, as we go through the show. Uh, but first, we're going to talk to you about Bet Online. Bet Online is the fastest and the easiest place to bet on all your favorite sports from MMA, boxing, NFL, NCAA football, the NHL, NBA. Bet online has you covered right now. Oklahoma is looking at a seven and they're a seven and a half point favorite against Oklahoma state heading into bedlam on Saturday night. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm shocked at, at that line right there. And I have a hard time taking Oklahoma and the minus the points um, heading into this one. But Hey, if you're so inclined and you want to, you know, lay a few dollars on Oklahoma minus the points, or you want to go the other way and put it on Oklahoma state plus the points, you can do that over at bet online. Again, the fastest and the easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports bet online is where the game starts. And this Saturday, the game is going to start at six 30 PM Saturday night in Bedlam. And they're the Oklahoma Sooners are also going to get another prime time game against Texas tech the following week at six 30 PM in Lubbock, which I'm not excited about that prime time game night games in Lubbock. Just, have a weird vibe to him. So not looking forward to that one. Um, Gunny, our guy Gunny, he says, he asks the question, how has team 28 not meshed this far along in the season? Josh. I don't know. I, I don't have a, a good answer for why that's been the case outside of they're not as good as we thought they were going to be. Uh, offensively at times, I'm not crazy about, some of the play calling. I mean, it just doesn't seem like there's a ton, ton of rhythm from Jeff Lebby at times. It's kind of just, I think I said this the other day, run, run, end around, deep ball, right? I don't know why the intermediate stuff has just gotten totally lost offensively for the Sooners. Uh, you, taught, you touched on it uh, as well, John. The play action numbers weren't great uh, in the last game in a game where you had Eric Gray running wild why don't you play action a little bit more? So that's part of the offensive stuff, uh, why it hasn't meshed there. I mean, the Dylan Gabriel injury for a game and a half probably didn't help things in that regard. And then just across the board, top to bottom defensively, I don't know. There's some kind of a disconnect uh, outside of just the fact that maybe the personnel is not what you would have liked it to be at a place like Oklahoma, right? Beyond just the personnel is not what it needs to be, John. I mean, for whatever reason, the the coaches just are not getting this team to improve as we go. And I, I don't have a good answer for why that is. Yeah, I think that's there's a lot to what you're saying there. Um, one thing that we need to explore is, is this team playing too tight? It's a very different style of coaching staff than what they had under the previous regime. Like the previous regime, you probably could qualify them as a player-friendly coaching staff with Lincoln Riley at the helm, Alex Grinch kind of, you know, they're more fun loving guys. Like, and I'm not saying that their way was the best way. I'm just saying that just the style, the attitude kind of mentality was a little bit different. Brent Venables is like hard nose, you know, knows the grindstone going to demand excellence. Every single snap, every single rep, every, like every single day, like best is the standard. It's not, it's never good enough right? Like that's what we saw in all those videos. Um, could it be that they're just th this group of players that was recruited in large part by Lincoln Riley maybe is playing too tight under a, a more serious, a more strict, a more demanding coaching staff. I mean, I, I, I think that there's something to that. You see it all the time in sports. A lot of times, like, you know, uh, and it, a lot of times it goes the opposite way, right? Like, they're under a, a dictatorial head coach, like a Bill Parcells, and they don't meet expectations. And then they go to a guy like Wade Phillips, 
and have a great season that next year because everybody's playing a little bit more looser, a little bit freer. This is not to say that Brent Venable's way isn't the right way. It's just to say like when you go from one style of coaching staff to another, it can have an impact on the players, especially if they didn't commit to Oklahoma to play for that style of a coach. Offensively, I definitely think there's probably a little bit of truth there. You know, the the difference between Riley and Lebby and – you know, look, I've not sat in on an Oklahoma practice. I'm basing a lot of this off of just kind of what we could gather over the five years of Lincoln Riley as the head coach and the couple more of him as an offensive coordinator. He seems a little bit more laid back and less uh, like a general in some senses than maybe Jeff Lebby, right? But, you know, Alex Grinch, I don't know that Look, Brent, Brent Venables is as intense as it gets, and that's probably gotten ramped up a notch from Alex Grinch. But uh, I don't think that it was some walk in the park with Alex Grinch as your defensive coordinator. I think that, you know, if you want to have that debate about were these guys kind of on pins and needles out there, that's probably been going on in Norman for a little bit, defensively anyways. Yeah, and that's very that's very possible, very real. I mean, defensive guys are just defensive guys. They're kind of built that way for the most part. Like, they're built intense because you kind of have to be to play defense. And a lot of the offensive staff is the same. And so you wonder, like, I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to really pinpoint any one particular thing that could be the disconnect in the, the chemistry on this team. It just it's, – it's odd. Jimmy asked the question, which I think is a great one. Is Marvin Mims' draft stock dropping like he does with his passes? I mean – this is a guy that we were seeing projected potentially as a first rounder early in the, you know, way too early mock draft se season in, you know, May, June. Later on in the summer, it became more like second and third round. Now I'm not seeing him, you know, projected in the top 100, which I think is reasonable. Wide receiver is generally the deepest position in the NFL draft. And if you're having a season like Marvin Mims, where it's, yeah, it's a little bit more productive, but he's yet to have a thousand yard season. He's yet to have a, you know, 10 touchdown season to his ledger and then you're having your your junior year where you're dropping balls you're not on the same page with your quarterback on a lot of in a lot of ways i mean i would say that his stock has probably dropped to the fourth or fifth round um as we're sitting right now of course i'm not a draft guru i'm not sitting in you know the front offices ability to get open downfield is it's not easily found and so that could help him a little bit, but I think he's got to play with some more consistency over these final two games. And if they play a bowl game in the bowl game to really solidify himself as a, a top three round pick right now, I just don't see it. You know, he's definitely not a first round, second round guy like he was in a lot of those early projections. And he was going to, I mean, it was going to take a great season. I think from Marvin Mims to lock up a, I, I don't know that he was ever going to be a first round guy, John, but to lock up late first round or definitely early second round, it was going to take, I think another, no pun intended, marvelous season for Marvin Mims. And he's been good in spots, but there's kind of been obviously some untimely drops. That's not going to show. Well, he's not the you know, prototypical, you know, uh, six foot three type wide receiver that other guys could be in the NFL draft. So that was always going to work against him unless he was just clearly the best wide receiver in college football. And he's not been that guy. Yeah. And it kind of begs the question a little bit. Does he come back for another year? Like, will he decide like, Hey, I need one more year to really like solidify myself in the draft or is this the best I'm going to be able to do? Um, I think there's better. Like, I think there's a more consistent season that he could have. But will it happen? I, I don't know that. I think there's a lot of questions about a lot of these guys that are, have choices to make this next over these next couple months. I don't think it's a surefire bet that the people that we thought were going to leave for the NFL are going to go. I think Eric Gray, Anton Harrison, those are two guys for sure. They're gone. NFL. Chris Murray, I think eligibility wise, he's probably about done. Uh, same with McKay Mattire. But that's kind of about it. Those are the only guys. I mean, Jalen Redmond might go, uh, but he might still have one more year of eligibility. I'd have to check that. But he, he think, would if he wanted it. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of guys that could could return to this team. I think there's a lot of guys that need to return if they want to improve their draft stock. Will they? That'll be a great question. Will we see some guys that we don't expect into the transfer portal and try and find something else uh, on on the way? Um, 
that is that that's going to be an interesting question on that. Josh, one question I want to ask you, and somebody kind of threw this hypo- hypothetical out there on Twitter, or or not even a hypothetical, but tried to say that Lincoln Riley, um, Caleb Williams, Mario Williams, and Latrell McCutcheon, not Latrell McCutcheon. Yeah, Latrell McCutcheon. No. Yeah, he went, he went to USC. Yeah, I could. I was getting him confused with the dude Andrew McCutcheon. I was trying. I was thinking it was Andrew McCutcheon from the Pittsburgh Pirates for a second. Sorry, sorry everybody. Um, Latrell McCutcheon, who Xavier Worthy made land on his head in the Red River Showdown last year, that they were the glue that held this team together. And I really like. First of all, it was a laughable premise. Um, you could say that you know Lincoln Riley was important. Obviously, he was a good coach for Oklahoma. Caleb Williams. I hate to say it, but obviously it's a downgrade at quarterback between what we had with Caleb Williams and what we have with Dylan Gabriel. But those other two guys, they really didn't have much of an impact on this team last year to say that about. So the question I want to ask you, though, is not that question. It's what was the bigger loss for Oklahoma? Was it losing Caleb Williams to the transfer portal or losing your five starters to the NFL draft? Nick Bonito, Isaiah Thomas, um, Perry on Winfrey, Brian Osamoa, and Deller and Turner Yell. What was the biggest, the the bigger impact or the bigger loss for this team? I mean, that's a, a great question. I think it's the, and I love Caleb Williams. Okay. Caleb Williams is going to be a high NFL draft pick. I think it's the accumulation of all of that talent that you mentioned, though defensively i mean this team throughout the season john has been so bad defensively i know we've got the west virginia game fresh on our minds where finally the defense plays well in the first half and it's the offense that mysteriously is bad and i'll I'll entertain the argument that you win the k-state game with uh, caleb williams playing quarterback i'll entertain the argument that you win this past weekend with uh caleb williams playing quarterback in Baylor, I don't know. Do you you don't throw the three interceptions, right? So I don't know. Maybe you are sitting here eight and two if you only had Caleb Williams, but something tells me that just top to bottom, this team would be better. If it, I mean, John, th- there's been no pass rush for this team since the Nebraska game. None. Yeah, and that's kind of where I lean too. Actually, is this team would be better if you had Nick Bonito and Perron Winfrey and Isaiah Thomas and Brian Osamoa. Uh, and, and DTY with the, you know, they've had issues at safety all year long. You've got a guy like DTY, although he had his own injury troubles and you did lose Patrick Fields as well to Stanford. Uh, but you lose all those guys. It makes a huge impact. Now they did have 27 pressures according to pro football focus this past weekend, but they only came away with two sacks. So, I mean, you lose Bonito and Thomas who were eight sack guys. Winfrey was a five sack guy. That makes a big inf- a, a big difference, uh, you know. And Chad Chad Littlefield Gunny he says, you know, defense win championships. Jimmy Satterfield agrees that, you know, the defensive talent it it makes a huge difference to lose those guys. And, and I think I really overestimated the Oregon game, the performances by Marcus Stripling and Ethan Downs in that game, Reggie Grimes, where they each had, you know, they, I think they had like five or six sacks in that game, and falsely extrapolated that out to what I thought was going to be a productive season for this team. And especially along the edge group, I wrote articles over at Sooners wire about how the, the edge trio of Marcus Stripling, Reggie Grimes and Ethan Downs were going to blow up and have a great season. And that really hasn't, you know, come to fruition. And so it, it, they definitely, that's one of the areas that's going to have to improve going to next year is like the defensive talent or the, the talent that's there has to take another step forward if they don't take another step forward, we're going to have more of the same on defense. If you know Ethan Downs and Reggie Grimes and Marcus Tripling don't improve over this offseason, because you know one you, you got a guy like R. Mason Thomas who's shown a lot of flash, like he's looking like a player. Um, but again, he's just a true freshman this year. He's going to have to earn his way onto the field next year. I think he's got a lot of you know promise, a lot of you know potential. It's just a matter of like can that come together and he take that step that provides that I don't even want to say elite pass rusher, but consistently good pass rusher. Cause that's been the issue is that these guys haven't been consistently good. It's been good here, there, but it's not been one of those things where you can line up Reggie Grimes or Marcus Tripling or Ethan downs and say, go get the quarterback. And one of those guys ends up getting the quarterback. It's just like they disappear for whole games. 
Yeah, no, I know. And we, we discussed this a little bit, the quarterback run game that's been a killer for Oklahoma. Well, you know, good guys on the edge helps contain that a little bit, right? Now, I know well, that – Brian Osamoa's speed. You're right. I, I you, That type of linebacker, no doubt. Uh, having a couple of linebackers like that, right? If you could pair that with Danny Stutzman, I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, Danny Stutzman had, for the most part, a pretty good game. I know that there were some faults late in the game for him, but that was easily one of the better games that he's played all season. Probably you could make the argument it was the best game that he's played all season. So when we see that – from Stutzman, it's like, okay, well, those those are the signs. If he had that type of speed flying all over the field, mixed with some serious edge guys and a defensive tackler or two that were difference makers, uh, now you've got something, right? Now now quarterbacks aren't running free on you and doing the kind of things they are. Probably it's going to boil down to this moving forward, John. This doesn't do much for you this week versus Oklahoma State or uh, the next week versus Texas Tech, but, man, P.J. Adebare, uh, Derek LeBlanc, they need those guys to step in quick and be difference makers. I mean, some of these defensive guys that they've signed or these guys that they got in the 22 signing class, they, they, it's, it's going to need to take a big leap forward because right now the guys on this roster, John, that are getting the serious snaps, I, I don't know that I see those being growing into the difference makers that gets Oklahoma over the top to a Big 12 championship game uh, or, you know, obviously back to a college football playoff. I mean, they need these young guys coming in to be legitimate difference makers. Yeah, I agree with you. And one thing that I really noticed when I was watching the Texas TCU game is Texas's interior defensive linemen. They're just huge, man. They are dudes. And yes, TCU was able to hit a big run game, but you know, from Kendra Miller, I think it was like a 75 yard touchdown run. But other than that, they were pretty well bottled up. And so was Max Dugan in his quarterback running game. You get two guys like them that just look like they just eat space, you know, uh, a Haloti Nada kind of a player, a Puna Ford kind of a player, just guys that are just huge that take up space. It gives it, it makes it really difficult for the quarterback run to be more effective because you got one of those guys that can take up all of the middle. Your edge guys can can worry about staying contained and playing their responsibilities and not having to worry about getting inside to slow down the running back. You got a guy that can stop the run in the middle. Your edge guys, your linebackers can focus more on the edges and playing contain, playing smart football. So, man, I I would love to see them land a guy like that. I think Ashton Sanders, who we talked to last week, could potentially be that if he adds a little bit more size, a little bit more bulk to him. He could potentially be that down the road for Oklahoma. If they can flip a guy like David Hicks, that'd be huge for him too because they just don't have anybody right now on the defensive line that's winning consistently in their one-on-one -on -one battles. And that's really what it comes down to is – when you're not having people winning their one-on-ones, then it makes it harder on everybody else from the front to the back. Uh, you know, Jimmy's saying, I wish, you know, uh, I hope Dan Danny Sussman sits on the bench. Man, I don't know. I think another, like another off season where he can learn from everything that transpired this season, that's only going to make him better going into next year. Like he, he's still just a sophomore. Like he's still a player that's growing. He's developing. He's got more work to do just like everybody else on the defense. But that's okay. Like that's part of development. It's a there's gonna take, you know, there's gonna be situations where these guys just have to learn. This whole season, I think for a lot of the guys on this defense, Billy Bowman, Danny Stutzman, Jaron Canick in a way, R. Mason Thomas, it's been a learning process for a lot of these guys. And they're gonna continue to grow and learn this offseason as they continue to get better and hopefully next year take another step. That's the hope. Now competition is gonna determine a lot of this, but you're losing guys like you know David Aguebu. You're losing uh, Deshaun White to probably to the NFL draft because they're out of eligibility. And so you need a guy like Danny Stutzman with his experience to take that step forward. Now they're going to have to hit the transfer portal to find some more depth at linebacker because if you just decide, hey, we got our 2022 freshman, our 23 freshman, and Danny Stutzman, I think you're, you're not in great shape. So you need to find some more experience at the linebacker level. Guys with legit production – that are going to be able to fly around the football and play with some speed. These final two games are huge for somebody like Danny Stutzman mm -hmm. because he's at the point now, John, to where and, – and, hey, look, let's not lose sight of the fact he played a good game at West Virginia, right? I know there were some moments late that uh, probably you'd say he didn't fit a couple of things upright, but generally speaking, he if he plays like that going forward, then Danny Stutzman's a legitimate football player at Oklahoma. That's more of what – you want to see from Danny Stutzman. But, okay, having said that, 
Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, hopefully a bowl game, and that's it, right? Danny Stutzman's played a lot of football at OU now. This is not Danny Stutzman's first year starting and playing linebacker, right? Okay, maybe it's the first year starting, but it's the first year that he's had that. But, man, it's the second year and a lot of games under the belt that he's been playing a ton of football at the University of Oklahoma. So he's not he's not getting graded the same way that – you know, a lot of other first time starters for Oklahoma are, and I get it. He's a sophomore and he's young and all that, but now he's kind of not a sophomore anymore. Now it's sort of the age old, well, you're more like a junior now. So we need to see before years end if he wants that job to be his and not what Jimmy's saying, then you better these last couple of games show that yes, he's turned a corner. Yeah, because he's going to get competition from, you know, Chad, he mentions Kip Lewis. You got Kobe McKenzie, you got Jaron Canick. And then in the 2023 class, we're looking at a good group also. Lewis Carter and Phil Picciotti and Samuel Omasigo, like some highly rated guys in the linebacker group. It's going to be a really deep group, just the 2022 and 2023 signees. So Danny Sutzman is going to get a little bit of competition. Now he's going to have to like really step his game up. Like the things that we were hearing about him in the offseason where Brent Venables is saying, hey, you got to take this seriously. He's going to have to really take this seriously. He's going to be one of the leaders on this defense, him and Billy Bowman, especially if a guy like Woody Washington goes off to the NFL, if Key Lawrence goes off. Like, if these guys leave, it's up to Billy Bowman and Danny Stutzman to really rally these guys and help them, you know, and make sure everybody's taking another step forward because they're the leaders on this team. Um, Ethan Downs, Marcus Tripling, Reggie Grimes, like all these guys that we're talking about, they're the key to Oklahoma's defense in 2023. They've got to take a step over the next three games. And then in the off season, hope we hope three games, um, but then in the off season as well, uh, you know, Greg, I think, yes, you're expected to produce, especially if you're starting. And I think it's like, there's been some good from Danny Stutzman. There's been some bad, uh, like a lot of the people on the defense, but I think the West Virginia game is a sign that like, Hey, he's a, he's a good player. He can make plays for you. The Iowa state game was one too, where he played really, really good. Uh, now it's a matter of like stringing week to week game, like games week to week, stringing good performances together and being consistent on the football field. The uh, echo jar. Interesting comment right there. Maybe uh, close to the finish line here. This team is better than the record. That's what's so frustrating. We need one less error in most of these games and it's a different story right now. It's gloom and doom city, right? For a lot of Oklahoma fans because it's uncharted territory. It's a, uh, the first time you've been this bad since the nineties, the late nineties. And yet what is said right there is true. This team is not that far away from being an eight and two football team. I can't convince you or myself that anything's different with the TCU game. Even if Gabriel doesn't get injured in that game, uh, Texas, you know, probably a different story, not 49 to nothing. If Dylan Gabriel is able to play that game. But again, I mean, it's hard for me to comment on that without Gabriel having played a snap. So throw those out. But the other games, you know, look, had every opportunity to win the Kansas State game. Had the the big third down play, couldn't get off the field. Uh, Baylor, plenty of opportunities to win that football game. Too many turnovers. And, again, do not come up with a timely stop late. And are you sensing a theme? West Virginia, as good as you had it uh, first half defensively. Again, chance to, to get the football back late. Couldn't do it. Though, look, I'll uh, be the first to tell you, and I've said it all week, I'm putting – most of the blame in this West Virginia loss squarely at the feet of the offense for that terrible first half. Yeah, I, I agree. we we agree on that front. I think the term that we're looking for is clutch and this team, isn't it? This team lacks that clutch gene right now. And maybe it's going to take several recruiting classes to create that. Maybe Danny Stutzman can be that he had the big interception against Iowa state that kind of sealed the game but you got to have more players like that. You got to have more players that are willing to, that are able to step up and perform in big time situations. Like I think about Woody Washington down on the goal line, you know, that fade route, like you needed to come up with a play there. Like you needed to come up with a stop and, and he couldn't do it. Um, you know, getting, getting a stop on fourth and 10, you know, when you're, when you're dropping seven or eight into coverage and the guy's able to fit a ball between three players, like, we, we, we just need more players that are able to be clutch. And right now we just don't have it across. Like we don't have, we don't have a quarterback that plays well in clutch situations. UCF fans tried to warn me of that in the off season. Um, we don't have 
a wide receiver right now that we can rely on to make big plays in clutch situations. We don't have anybody in the secondary, say for maybe a Billy Bowman um, that can step up in clutch situations. And we don't have a defensive line that's winning one-on-one battles. So that's kind of where we're at. That doesn't mean that that's the end all be all. That's not the end of the story. This is just chapter one of the Brent Venables you know, story that is being written. I still believe it's going to get better. I still believe that Brent Venables is going to turn this thing into a contender, into a winner. But the 2022 season, it is what it is. You're an average team is hoping, it, for, hoping for bowl eligibility. Is it too negative Nancy over here, which apologies to all of the Nancys that support this Locked On Sooners channel, really appreciate your support. Is it, is it too honest of me to say that I'm no longer convinced that Brent Venables is going to get this thing turned around? I'm not. I, I, I'm not. I'm not convinced that he won't, but I'm not convinced that he will either. I'm, I'm so – I don't know what's going to happen with Oklahoma that it's, it's difficult right now. And I think probably a lot of fans, if they're being transparent and honest, feel similarly that you're hopeful, but you don't know. And this time – well, not this time a year ago, but six months ago – I think you, I, everybody would have said, no doubt. Brent Venables, it's going to be a home run. This thing's going to go great. And, hey, props to you if you're one of the fans that's still very optimistic on this thing. I'm just – this West Virginia loss was the moment to where I don't think I'm there anymore. Now, having said that, the importance of these games, man, and what we'll be talking about the rest of this week – Look, first and foremost, it's Bedlam, so you want to go win Bedlam, right? And then beyond that, Texas Tech, these close losses we're discussing here, Oklahoma, the razor-thin line between maybe being an 8-2 and two football team, and yeah, people being frustrated, but not to the point to where this thing is at right now, concerned about what the future for Venables in this program looks like. Just win. Just, just win these last couple of games, man, because right now you've got a program that I'm concerned about in this regard, John, that they don't have winning confidence. They've got losing fears. They don't have winning confidence. And I want to touch on that on tomorrow's episode of Locked On Sooners. Can Brent Venables turn this thing around? I think Josh and I are going to have a really fun debate on that um, for, for our next episode. So make sure you're tuned in. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. Thanks to everybody that tuned in for the live show tonight. We're going to try and start doing it maybe uh, on Monday nights, maybe at 9 o'clock or so. We'll see how the, the schedule holds up. If the Chiefs are playing on Monday night football for Josh or the Dallas Cowboys are playing on Monday night football for me, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But again, thank you so much for everybody tuning in and being a part of the show. We love your comments. We love your questions. This is always so much fun. Uh, just to do this with you and to have the interaction and get the feedback as well. It's just, a, it's one of our favorite parts of the week um, all week long, just getting to interact with you all here as well. So make sure again, if you're, if you're subscribed, thank you. If you're, you've got a friend that's not make sure they're subscribed to the show over on YouTube or wherever they get their podcasts until next time where I fight with Josh about Brent Venable's future. We'll catch you.